Hi there. Thanks to everyone for coming. We want to go ahead and get started with our lunch panel while everyone's enjoying their lunch. I'm Claire Aldridge, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Commercialization and Business Development at UT Southwestern. And I'm so happy to be here and so happy that all of you have taken time out of your busy schedules to join us as we really focus on innovation in the state of Texas. This session is really focusing on why does Texas underperform in the VC market and what can we do about it? Again, following the, the path of the critique, we, we know that there are things that we can do to improve the environment here in the state, and so we're going to spend some time hearing from this group about that. Um, our panel will be moderated by uh, Andrew Strong. Andrew Strong is a partner at Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, and Pittman, and he's a partner there and has represented private and public company clients in the life sciences, emerging technology, energy, and transportation for the last 25 years. And he's worked along the entire continuum from startups all the way to Fortune 500 companies. And previously, he was general counsel and compliance officer for the Texas A&M system. But he's based here in Texas, and he counsels international and U.S. biotech founders, investors, and executives on everything from financing and company building and technology licensing. And uh, he'll be moderating this fantastic panel, which he'll introduce to you now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Claire. And thank you for everybody being here for this topic. And uh, as we just heard from the last session, it really was a great setup for what we're going to talk about today, because if you remember the slide that Adam put on the screen of the Valley of Death, um, <laughs> that, is, that is the real life Valley of Death for many companies and many ideas that you know, otherwise, uh, but for funding, could have great success. And so the, the three legs of the stool, per se, to any technology or idea in terms of making it out and ultimately being commercially successful is the science behind it, of course, uh, the management team or the people, and then money. And so we have an awesome panel here that we're going to, in our next 44 minutes, talk about the money, um, or otherwise known as where's the beef, if you all remember that. <laughs> um, when I was uh, a young engineer lawyer, my boss told me, it's not about the velocity of your career, it's about the trajectory. Well, I would submit that in this space, it's both velocity and trajectory, and you've got to hit it right. And so what we'll do over the course of the next uh, uh, half hour to 45 minutes is we'll kind of have each of the panelists give an introduction of themselves and kind of what they do. I've given them each some topics to cover, and then we'll do that uh, as quickly as we can. Then we'll kind of get into a dialogue on some questions about what is going on in Texas. Uh, where tops in the nation in terms of research dollars, but in terms of venture dollars, we're not anywhere close. And so is it, what is the, are there are any problems that we can cure and you know, what their ideas are in terms of things that we should be doing. We have seen um, state programs like CEPRIT that have been instrumental in the growth of the ecosystem for life sciences. What other things can we be doing? So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jim Breyer. And Jim is the uh, founder and leader of Breyer Capital, also one of the sponsors of this event. So thank you, Jim. And uh, you know, when, you, when you look up Jim on the internet, uh, he gets a, a Wikipedia page comes up. And so I don't <laughs> know many people that have Wikipedia pages, but Jim does. And that's a tribute to his success as an investor and some of his early investments in Facebook and other you know, notable companies. So Jim, thank you very much for being here. Well, Andrew, it's a great pleasure to be here in Texas. Uh, my friend Bob Metcalf uh, planted the idea uh, about coming to this conference about four months ago when I met with him in, in Austin, where I am currently uh, in the final processes of buying a home and setting up a Briar Capital office in Austin. Uh, the first office outside of Silicon Valley that I've set up in the United States. I've set offices up in the past in London and in Beijing, where we have 10 offices now throughout China. Uh, but this is the first extension within the US. And I would just offer a couple thoughts. Moments for reflection, I believe, are unfortunately too rare, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, 
whether it's Monday morning quarterbacking or we evaluate what went into a successful venture and the hindsight bias that often uh, accompanies so much of the post-investment analysis or anatomy of a deal, I'll just dial back to 2005 uh, for a moment, which was uh, very significant for three reasons for me. Uh, one, I met a 20-year-old on April 2nd named Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, spent a week with Mark and his team of seven. Uh, by the end of the week, we shook hands. I invested $11 million in the Series A in Facebook, joined the board, and remained on the board through all the ups and downs, uh, mostly ups, but there are always downs, uh, for 10 years and then retired. And that was a classic startup venture uh, deal where we had a, a phenomenal entrepreneur founder who just listens and soaks up listening. Uh, very underestimated in many ways through those early years, largely because of his youth. But we also had dysfunction along other elements of the team, which I knew going in would have to be addressed. <clears throat> and so it was a three-person board for the first four years. And then we eventually increased the board. Uh, just as important as making the investment, all of you will relate to this, is when I worked very hard, helped Mark hire Sheryl Sandberg in 2008. And that was a critical element of the journey. And so that's one of the classic early stage venture capital, raise enough money for 18 months, reduce risk, raise money at a higher price hopefully, uh, continue to reduce risk uh, as we uh, try to build a very sustainable leading company just the way 3Com or Cisco or uh, many others did it over the years. And that's still the bread and butter, and that's a phenomenal opportunity, I think, for Texas. Uh, one of the compelling reasons for me on Texas is I'm seeing so many of the best and brightest early 30-year-olds from Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, moving to Texas and starting new ventures, doing the fastest, best ad uh, technology no longer is a mission-driven, uh, exciting proposition for many of the very best entrepreneurs. And so I think we're going to see a tremendous uh, response in areas of where AI meets medicine, where AI meets public policy. AI, last night I was uh, speaking to the, many of the military leaders that were there last night and the importance of AI, certainly both proactively uh, offensively and defensively around protecting, whether it's a police force, uh, a fire department, or of course, uh, with all that's going on internationally. Another venture deal, a little less conventional, uh, but a very important one, and I think as we look at Texas, we'll see more and more of these, uh, and that was a management buyout. I worked with a team at BBN for about uh, a year, uh, BBN, uh, depending on who you talk to, there were 600 employees in Boston, 300 of them uh, were MIT graduates. Uh, they were owned by Verizon. They wanted to spin out of Verizon. And so for a year, I worked with them and the management team and uh, Briar Capital and my firm at the time, Axel Partners, bought out the business. We built it. Five years later, we sold it to Raytheon at a very healthy multiple. But these were all executives in their 40s and 50s. They had not built startups, but they had all the natural inclination around how to reduce risk, uh, where to focus, how to move a service business into a product-oriented business. And so, so often when people think of venture capital, it's the classic early stage, which I think is a real critical role that uh, the U.S. plays in the world. There's no other venture ecosystem like it. But I look back at BBN, and uh, I've had some wonderful luck in companies like Marvel Entertainment, which I invested when it was a little bit later and remained on the board for eight years. Uh, venture capital really is alternative investing and applying creative approaches, trying to build public, world-class leaders. And when I, again, did the bottoms up, the top down, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, 
I really believe the areas that are going to be most profound uh, over the next couple of years in the areas where I invest, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence meets medicine, artificial intelligence uh, in areas that I discussed around 5G, uh, vision recognition. I think it's going to be Silicon Valley. It'll be Texas, and it's what we call the Southern Bay Area of China as clearly the three leading ecosystems uh, in the world. And so what gets me particularly excited, uh, as I'm sure the uh, newest individual to the state of Texas, uh, is one, how welcoming uh, Texans and my business associates have always been here, whether it's Bob Metcalf, I was on the board of Dell for five years, could go on and on. And there's an entrepreneurial spirit, a technology underpinning, and a leapfrog opportunity in so many ways. And that's what I'm hoping over the next decade and two, uh, to participate in a very active way, provide guidance when I can, help. And uh, I think we'll have a very different headline 10 years from now around Texas and where Texas performs relative to worldwide VC funding. And most importantly, uh, how it performs in terms of generating phenomenal companies and returns over a long period of time. So a very exciting time here in Texas. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next, uh, we have Jerry Siwak, who's with RA Capital, which primarily invests in life sciences uh, companies. Uh, Jerry's background's in uh, molecular and cell biology, his PhD, and uh, has, you know, I want him to talk about how RA Capital looks at investing in companies and also how it's leveraging its scientific internal expertise. And Jerry's got some slides. Uh, which may or may not work, but that's always <laughs> the case, right? Um, I don't know if you can advance them from the back. Uh, if not, that, that's fine as well. So I'm Jerry Seawalk. Um, I'm part of the venture team at RA Capital. Um, <coughs> RA Capital is a multi-stage uh, investment company that's dedicated solely to investing in, uh, in innovative and disruptive technologies and companies in the life science space. So on the panel, I'll try to give my perspective on, from a life science perspective, where Texas is um, compared to all the other technologies we see in all the other areas and uh, ecosystems that are around it. Um, if you can advance it one. Um, because we're a multi-stage uh, fund, we have the ability to invest in both public and private companies. That allows us the flexibility to be involved with uh, innovation in companies from inception all the way through commercialization. And so that gives us an interesting viewpoint on, on the whole kind of life cycle. So we, we participate in, in seed rounds for startup companies. We're also involved with um, investing in private rounds, AACs, we can lead those. We are also involved, one of probably the preeminent um, crossover funds in the life science industry. We were part of the crossover team that did Peloton from, uh, from Texas as well. And then we also can support our portfolio companies when they're on the public side. Um, we try to provide more than just capital, um, and as part of that, when I was hired uh, at RA Capital um, eight years ago, it was to put together a team uh, that's called the Tech Atlas Research Group. So Peter Kolchinski, who's our managing director, is a very uh, insightful, out-of-the-box thinker, and he devoted a lot of time and resources to putting together a very large team, especially for the size of the fund at that time. It was probably about $250 million at the time. Um, fast forward to eight years later, we're now um, we have over $3 billion in assets under management. He put together, he wanted me to hire a team that would look at all the competitive landscapes where we invested to make sure that we understood the context of everything that was available, where the unmet needs were, and what would be successful in these different areas. And so we have a team of uh, over 30 people now who just do research in these different in, uh, therapeutic indication spaces. Um, they all have backgrounds similar to mine. I have a, a PhD from, um, from Harvard Med School. Um, so we're very science and data driven uh, in, in the organization. And so this gives us a, a unique uh, perspective to, to kind of compare where technology is coming from, um, how it's fostered, and, and my role on the venture team now um, allows me to look at what it takes to kind of start up a company. And so as we're thinking about uh, comparing Texas to other areas, I think um, one of the things that came to mind is how do we look at an investment? And I think uh, Dr. Olson spoke on the panel previously. and so. I think I'm gonna confirm a lot of what he said about the life science industry and kind of the early, um, how do you translate medicine from 
academic institutions and move it into a company format. Um, and I think that's interesting because I'm confirming it from the investment side. So he's from the, the company startup side, but I think from our side, it's what we look for as well. Um, everything that we look for for a, a, what we think could be a good investment and therefore what we think would be a successful company and would bring a therapeutic that would be disruptive and bring something to a patient's lives is looking for a leverageable idea or an asset. Um, when we're very excited about what's going on in Texas now. Um, actually, my colleague Netta is uh, based here. Uh, so we have a presence here um, because we're so excited. We want to make sure that we're able to be a part of what's happening. Um, the, the research, the academic and translation, translational research is just really elite and world class down here. Um, part of it is I think we think it's a little unrecognized and so we're willing to come down here and make the effort and make sure that we're, we see the opportunities where um, that might give us a competitive advantage. Um, I'm sure that's going to change. I think it's one of those things that as more success stories start building on, on each other, it's going to be more recognized. Um, we think communicating the ideas is super important and we see that in different areas. There's areas in Baltimore that also want to become kind of biotech hubs where communicating the actual opportunities becomes as important as generating the ideas. And so Ned has had the great fortune of working with uh, Claire Aldridge at uh, UT Southwestern and uh, uh, Farhan uh, Pratt um, over at um, MD Anderson, where they're really facilitating our ability to evaluate all the different ideas and, and really be there to kind of support that, that type of activity. Um, I think the next thing that we kind of look for is, is, is proof of concept, and I think this is where we're a Boston-based company, and so we see kind of the, the Kendall Square ecosystem and, and how powerful that is. Um, I think having the great ideas and then taking them the next step where you need to look for something that really shows you that this is a great idea that has a direct path to what we like to call the killer app or just really solving a really an unmet need where it can compete and be the best technology. Um, those are the things where you need to build a team, and so there's been some discussion of having the recruitable talent and kind of a critical mass of people who are kind of skilled in the, in the ways of translating something into industry. Um, that's something that Ned has told me and I know I've looked in the CPRID and some of the other things, the inspiring talk by a, um, a doctor, I'm sorry, it's a priest uh, from MD Anderson, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Um, but the inspiring talk that he gave about trying to put together the right translational teams to really build that infrastructure here so that when venture capital comes in and they do fund a company, they continue to fund a company that's based in Texas. Um, so I think that's somewhere where if you put in the infrastructure, if you put in the, the incubator space, that's some things we see like Lab Central, different things we see in Cambridge that really fosters that critical mass. Once you start building that, I, I'm a big baseball fan, so it's kind of if you build it, they will come, I think, is, is, is the way to do it. And it just takes time and money and a, and a commitment to doing it. Um, so that's kind of our, our thoughts on, on the Texas system. Great. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, next, I'd like to turn to Carrie Rupp, who's a general partner with True Wealth Investors uh, venture firm, and uh, their firm uh, invests primarily in women-led businesses. And so, Carrie, tell us a little bit about yourself. And sure, yeah. So, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, I'm with True Wealth Ventures. We're an Austin-based, so here in Texas, VC fund. We're small and we're niche, um, and that's really specifically what I'm going to talk about today, the importance of that or, or why you might actually want to target a small niche firm. So we're a seed stage fund. We invest actually exclusively in women-led companies um, as an investment thesis. And so we look at the fact that there's a lot of data out there. If you haven't seen it yet, it's the last couple of years has actually finally been proliferated, that when there are more women in senior leadership in companies, they outperform. Um, and yet today, even today, uh, since that data has been out for several years, uh, about two per it's grown from 2 to 2.2% .2 of venture dollars are going to companies with a woman CEO. And even if you look at companies that have at least one woman founder, it's, you know, 15 to 17% of companies that get funded have a single woman you know, executive on the team. Yet, there's data that shows from the Fortune 500 companies all the way down to venture-backed startups that when there are women lead leaders, the companies have, in a McKinsey study of Fortune 500 companies, 40% higher return on equity, 56% higher EBITDA, and so it's a missed opportunity. Uh, so us, for us as a venture capital fund, you know, that's a great place to invest. 
Um, and we took that thesis a, a layer deeper to say, well, women are making 85% of consumer purchase decisions. They're making 80% of healthcare decisions. Certainly, in those markets, there ought to be at least one woman on, on the executive team bringing that perspective. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, uh, but not obvious because it's not happening um, in those markets. And so we specifically invest in uh, what we call sustainable consumer or consumer health, so things where consumers are making the, the buying decisions, but they're either in healthcare or things that are improving the environment. Um, and uh, in addition to this venture fund, I've actually been teaching for the National Science Foundation's i program for the last four years. I imagine a lot of you in here know what that is, but we take uh, uh, PhD candidates and the professors who have an invention or an innovation that's generally been NSF funded. It can be NIH or other, um, other agencies. And if they think they're ready to take it to market, actually help them go out and do customer discovery to identify, is there actually a market? This, this invention may be novel, and it may be the first time that's ever been invented, but does anyone care in the market? Is there anyone who actually has a pain that, that for whom this solves a problem, they're willing to actually pay for it? And uh, so over the course of the last four years, I've been doing that with literally hundreds of academic teams, uh, both at the national level and um, at UT, and with some other programs um, in, in Austin. And so I think you know, it really brings some great perspective to both what's happening in the commercial world of fundable startups and then the early stages of academic teams that are trying to find their way to be, um, to be actual startups that are going to get funded. Um, and so obviously I have a very niche focus. It probably doesn't apply to a lot of you, but I think what's important is to understand why it matters to have funds that have a, a niche focus. If you looked at, Austin has been ranked for the last several years as one of the top startup ecosystems, uh, and that's great. And when we look at venture capital in Texas, two to 4% of venture capital comes to Texas. So we're the fifth largest market in terms of venture capital after the Bay Area and New York and Boston and LA, and yet it's two to four percent of dollars. And so um, there's money there, but there's not a lot of money. And when you look at it, if you looked a couple years ago, almost all of the VC funds, literally almost all of them, were doing B2B SaaS software. We're in a room full of engineers and medical professionals and scientists, and I bet you one to two percent of you are doing B2B SaaS software. You're probably doing really hard tech, physical manufacturing of products, uh, et cetera, and that requires a completely different kind of investor. You aren't going to convince a B2B SaaS software who's used to a company that has zero marginal cost and really high scalability to invest in your company. So you have to find VC funds that actually are interested in, understand, and have the patience and tenacity uh, and relationships and expertise to actually go help you with your uh, product. And what that means is a lot of hard work on your part to identify the VCs who actually have a matching uh, value proposition. So just like we teach customer discovery to startups to go understand who's your market, who cares about your product from a customer point of view, you really need to go understand who your investor is and how they work and what drives them. So Katie alluded to it earlier, one of the things about VC funds is that we have a generally a 10-year time horizon, and when we're writing the check, we need to know we're going to be able to get the returns back within that timeline. And so if you're in year four or five of a fund, in the end of their investment period, it needs to be, the company needs to be even further along and more likely to be investable. Like literally understanding the business dynamics of what happens in my firm, it also might mean that your investor might be better suited to be a family office who has a you know, multi-generational timeline to make the, you know, bring the money back in, et cetera. And so uh, the importance of finding an investor who understands your industry, who cares about your technology, who has the right relationships in your industry to help you get customer contracts, uh, who has a lot of the technologies you guys are probably working on might be being sold to huge big corporate entities. They might be being sold to the government. Think about the sales cycle. You think you have a deal. They've said, oh, we're definitely going to buy it. We just need to get into the next budget cycle. And two years later, you're still waiting for that contract to sign. You need an investor who has the timeline to actually stick that out. That is not the same kind of investor who is looking for a really fast, highly scalable, you know, let's turn this uh, investment around really quickly kind of model. Um, and so all that to say is, um, you know, there are different niche kinds of firms, and they're starting to pop up in different places. So while we're still only a small percent of the venture ecosystem, if you look, for example, specifically at the Austin VC scene today, there are several funds that are now doing, you know, consumer investing. They're assembled doing CPG. There's a little bit more med device happening, et cetera. And so I think we'll talk in the discussion later on about what we do as a, you know, as a state to facilitate that growth. Uh, but I think it's important to really think about um, understanding the niche and just be 
VC is not VC, capital is not capital, um, and understanding who your right target investor is is a process. It's actually a lot of hard work. There's no great database that says, okay, I'm looking for this kind of a biotech investor with this kind of time horizon, et cetera. There's no database. So it's a lot of uh, meeting your peers, going to VC websites, seeing who they've invested in previously, get, having some pre-qualifying conversations to understand whether they're a fit or not, not trying to convince them you're still exciting when it's not what they do. Um, but, but I think sort of that's the theme of my talk is, you know, really understanding who, th who the right fit investor is for you um, and that niche firms can really have a fit, um, especially those that are willing to work with commercializing university technology, which is really different than, you know, some 20-year-old kids out of Harvard who are going to go do something in software that they can do without a lot of cash requirements. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I hope you can top that, Clay, because that, I can't. That, was, that was really impressive. I was saying, that's, that's so, well done. Yeah, Clay, uh, Clay Hyten, who's our last speaker, is a former ER doc who started up and uh, exited several companies and now is a uh, founding member and uh, venture investor in Green Park Golf and Get. Green Park and Golf Ventures, right. and um, you know, is investing in the types of companies that you would be spinning out uh, out of your labs. So, so uh, I, I just want to uh, shout out to uh, Bill Henrich, who uh, in 1981 uh, he asked a question earlier about you know what's happening to West Texas and the Permian Basin. He was by attending at, in medical school at, at San Antonio and. I think that Helen Hobbs, uh, I don't know if I've seen her here, was uh, my chief resident at Southwestern when I did a residency. I was inspired uh, in 85 when I was a third year resident by, uh, that was the year that Dr. Brown and Goldstein won the Nobel Prize. And so I'm just inspired and thankful for all the work that those people have done and influence they've had in my life and, and what you guys do. Very humbled to be in front of you. I built a a large medical group that was sold to Texas Health Resources in 2011 and um, uh, started a family office with my partner in, the, in that group. His name's Carl Soderstrom. And uh, we didn't know exactly what, what we wanted to do. We hired a, a, an MBA guy who's now our partner in Green Park and Golf. And so uh, we wanted to invest in early stage stuff. We knew about healthcare, uh, and so we did that. And, uh, didn't know anything about the ecosystem in Texas or Dallas uh, in venture capital at all uh, until 2012. We started investing in 10 companies a year. And um, how we do that is that we, um, uh, we, we kind of form a, a syndicate of angels. We, we do the due diligence, uh, uh, me from a clinical point of view, and, and uh, uh, we have a PhD who trained at Southwestern who's great, uh, and a woman who, um, is uh, uh, in with us to, to look at the science. She's a, a, a molecular uh, biologist. And um, we decide uh, about every quarter how, uh, to invest in two to three companies. And we bring in a group of people. We do the due diligence. We write a, a thesis. We negotiate the terms. If they don't already have a term sheet or approve the term sheet, we form an LLC to invest through. Then we have people that are in sort of, you know, uh, medium low value family offices or, or uh, uh, high net worth individuals to just come in and hear it. They meet the uh, uh, entrepreneur, the CEO, and then we uh, say, you have five days to give us your number and then we invest it. And so we've invested $75 million doing that over the last um, uh, seven or eight years. Uh, we do uh, about eight new companies a year and about uh, three to four uh, follow-on investments of companies that are doing well. We do mostly seed and A. I think what you find out from uh, what I've learned uh, from venture capital guys, that they move a little further along. They tend to invest, you know, after an A round maybe. I know you do a, a lot of uh, a, a round stuff. A lot bigger numbers. And um, so uh, uh, we're, we're in front of that, but it seems to make sense to go more to the right, but we don't have the you know, uh, amounts of money to make those types of big investments. So uh, what, we, uh, what, what niche we have uh, is the, the niche of uh, you know, the maybe smaller market idea, uh, uh, lower valuation to start with, you know, we can be, you know, have a good outcome with a $40 million or a $50 million exit. 
uh, if it's a little higher valuation or requires more uh, uh, follow-on money, you know, we might be able to be successful with 100 million. If it, you know, hits 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 uh, hits a, a home run, then we can invest as we go along. So what I see uh, in in Texas is that first of all, you know, we don't get to we don't get to deserve to have to be a, a venture capital mecca. Uh, you know, Boston's been around for a long time. They've had great institutions for a long time. They've had great research for a long time. San Francisco, a little bit of a kind of a really fast uh, evolution into a venture capital mecca. Not sure exactly if anyone knows how that happens, but uh, I think the position that Texas is in, if you really look at the country, is not a bad position. And I think we've made a lot of progress in Texas. Uh, the, particularly what I see uh, uh, in healthcare uh, investing is this lack of a, a large number of people that can run a company. And, and what I see in, uh, in places like San Francisco is that folks are, are willing to take a risk to be a CEO or, or, or an executive in a company because they know that if that doesn't work out, there's three more that are ready to hire them. Uh, in Dallas-Fort Worth in particular, if you take on that role, or particularly if you move here from somewhere else, you've disrupted your whole family, and if it doesn't work, there's not another, you're probably going to have to move to San Francisco or Boston or New Jersey uh, to make it work. So there's early comments. and Excellent. Okay, so we got about 15 minutes left, and we're going to spend 10 minutes with some Q&A where I'm going to ask the panelists questions, and we'll open it up to um, outside question. So let's start with the premise that every member of the academy that's in here has probably got, not gotten there by chance and they probably <laughs> have uh, conceived ideas that have actually made it into a company. And so we, what, what we're doing here is we're going to talk about you know, post-company development and you know, where, where do we go from here? How do we create a successful company through financial means? And so I want to ask uh, I asked Jim, I asked you the question, uh, true or false? Any check written is a good check. That sure is false. <laughs> 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 and so uh, what, what I would say, for, there's immense talent in this room. And I uh, was on the Harvard University Senior Governing Board for six years. I just retired, very involved with Stanford Engineering. Most of the spin-outs that I invest in are out of Stanford, UCSF, uh, Harvard, MIT, Columbia, uh, most recently in healthcare out of the Columbia Medical School. Uh, the, the one thing I would say is uh, you want to set the tables right early. Uh, I spent probably nine months negotiating a contract with Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, in computational pathology, where the new startup, Page AI, has exclusive rights to all the MSK breast cancer and prostate cancer data that they've built uh, over their lifetime. And that's extremely valuable. But then to, and we finalized it, uh, we have a terrific group, interdisciplinary, and that's one other theme I would mention today, uh, Ten years ago when we were doing social networking investments, or 20 years ago, the internet, uh, or even before that, uh, I go back to the early days of Apple, uh, you didn't need the interdisciplinary teams the way you do today. If we're doing uh, a computational pathology new company, uh, this is called Page AI, we started with the phenomenal resources, technology, and data at Memorial Sloan Kettering. That's the anchored data, if you will. We're talking to MD Anderson and Yale and Stanford and UCSF and the Michael and Susan Dell Medical School uh, to add additional very high quality data to fill out the different elements of where we want to go as a company to eradicate to the extent we can cancer uh, in a reasonable uh, amount of years. Uh, but boy, then you have to bring in the brilliant machine learning types uh, from Google and Facebook and Amazon who are in their early 30s whose pace is one of let's break things, see how it works, <laughs> break things again. That's not going to work with the FDA. 
as you would imagine. <laughs> and so getting the cultures integrated, getting the genius pathologist, in our case at Memorial Sloan Kettering, David Klimstra, uh, to work with the 32-year-old ex-Google Facebook engineer, uh, where they just have different views on pace and product and how to introduce something to the FDA and when. Those are the big challenges, but that's, I think, where all the hard work, deep knowledge uh, present in the room today, that's where it's really going to pay off because starting with very deep intellectual property that's highly defensible uh, and then building interdisciplinary teams around that to figure out how to go to market through partners, direct, that's the art, if you will, of creating the business. And that's why this is such an exciting time, whether it's Texas or whether it's a lot of the uh, great academic institutions in our country in particular, medical schools, higher ed departments, where uh, if the chemist at Harvard College of Arts and Sciences can interact deeply with the chemist at Harvard Medical School uh, and Brigham and Women's, and then add in five to seven brilliant programmers, uh, we can change uh, the cycle time. It takes 10 days typically to get slides back, uh, whether it's prostate or breast cancer. Uh, my goodness, if we can make that two days with far better accuracy, Think of what we're doing in terms of physicians and patients and medical care. And that's the path that we're on and we're proving right now. And so there are a lot of other areas where that's the case. Uh, so it's necessary to start with brilliant technical insights, defensible work, but it's certainly not sufficient. And it's that sufficiency which uh, we as venture capitalists spend so much time trying to, trying to get right. So the sophistication of the technology merits the sophistication of the investor. Absolutely. That anybody who would write a check is not necessarily the person you want first in. Great. Um, well said. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's, uh, let's move down the line here. So uh, uh, Carrie and Clay, you guys see lots of early invest, you know, investable opportunities and probably more than you can even review in the time that you have, what would you say are the kind of the top three attributes that kind of get them to second base in your evaluation? Well, they have revenue. <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, so if it's a software with revenue uh, and the valuation's right, I mean, that's easy to figure out. Yep. Um, if it's a really great science and uh, 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 Lauren Tyra, our scientist of the group uh, looks at it and says it's really great science and we're lucky enough to be able to participate in something like that then that's great from a from a uh, CEO point of view uh, I think that uh, you know we're looking for folks that are good listeners uh, that are learners that uh, uh, create opportunities for their employees and have a culture where people have have fun they're that kind of person that people want to work for them and that they're all in and that they've left their other job and uh, they have to make this work or they don't have a plan number two. Great. Okay. And I, I like to joke that like in real estate it's uh, location, location, location. In startups it's team, team, team. But I'm not, I'm not really joking actually <laughs> though. Um, and so often, especially with academic driven teams, the thought is obviously that it's this idea or that it's this great innovation or technology. Uh, but that, again, you know, going back to this, it's necessary but not sufficient. In fact, it's one of the reasons a lot of things fail. And when you say team, it's this whole set of both, you know, quantitative and qualitative things about that person's, the, not that person, the team's expertise and their complementarity, et cetera. But it's also, um, as a VC, like taking it from is the science amazing to is the business going to work about the ability of that team to be market facing and customer facing and going back to that concept of customer discovery, understanding who their customer is, what drives them, what problems their businesses are having, and why the solution that they're building is actually going to meet a must have need for them and work in a business model that works for them, you know, that the, the finances actually work in a way that the value is there. And those are things that most of the people that are working in engineering and science and medical labs don't have expertise around. 
Uh, and it's one of the things where I think the entrepreneurial ecosystem needs to match up with the academic and commercial ecosystem to either teach those things and or bring in these outside resources who are the business people that are going to actually help spur that together. And so I think especially in this context, understanding uh, that marketing is not a silly afterthought, but it's actually the fundamental understanding of the customer and, and who you're going to build, build this for uh, is really critical. Um, and so I really spend a lot of time understanding, does this entrepreneur understand their customer and how that customer does business and what their days look like and what their problems are, et cetera. And so for me, it really is team, team, team. And then if you make me differentiate and tell you a second and third, it's the size of the market opportunity and the, the severity of the pain. So it's, there are lots of interesting nice to haves, but if there's not anybody who's actually so suffering from that issue that they're gonna pay for it, it's not gonna make it. And, and the size of the market opportunity is a venture capital specific thing. So some of the things that I'm looking for specifically doesn't mean there isn't a good business there. It means it's not a venture scalable business where I, as an investor who has to, has to make you know, really high returns to make up for the risk of the, all the businesses I'm gonna invest in that will fail, um, needs to see, right? So there are other avenues of funding, whether it's angel funding or grant funding or other kinds of models, or self-funding and customer funding, which by the way is the best because it's free, you know, it doesn't take anything away from you. That, that your business still may be viable, but if you want venture capital money, I want a huge big market <coughs> opportunity, have, highly scalable, et cetera. And I think differentiating in your mind, uh, oh, venture capital is not great for everybody, it's great for these scenarios is really important. Great. I was, okay. just, I was gonna add one thing yeah, on, go for it. just uh, the twist on the life science angle is it's the same type of thing where the science and the technology really has to be something that can win in a certain area. So I'd mentioned the killer app. And so we have a lot of people that come to us with amazing science or a great platform technology. And we're like, this is awesome. So what do you, what do you want to apply it to? What's, what's, the, what's the application? And they say, well, it can do everything. And we say, well, show us somewhere where it can do something better than anything else that's already out there. And that's a really tough thing to do. And so we try to help them and we have a lot, we had the maps I had shown before, trying to guide them to do that. And so the technology could be there, but understanding if you can start to think about what is the real application where people will want to use this and this will help patients and this will be disruptive, that, that's really critical. So uh, I'll make one more question and we'll open it up. But uh, I was thinking eight days ago, it was, uh, I was thinking 20 years ago, I was in Las Vegas waiting for Y2K to have the world explode. <laughs> and around that same time, I know uh, just from reading you know, newspapers in Houston, were Chronicle and the Dallas Morning News, you know, there was this, not, this thought of this brain drain going on in Texas where a lot of our ideas that are, are, are you know, grown here are taken to other states, you know, California, Boston, wherever, mm -hmm. and the technology would grow. So we have changed that. CPRT has been a part of that uh, in the cancer therapeutics and uh, device area. But you know, uh, for, for you guys who are out of state and are looking at Texas, and you know, we talked about velocity and trajectory of these companies. Velocity is obviously important. That's why Dr. Olson talked about Exonix going to Boston. What do we do now? I mean, you're coming here, that's fantastic. RA's got people here. Right. What's our next step to continuing the velocity and keeping these companies in Texas? Um, I was just going to say, I, I think <laughs> building that infrastructure, so I think you may not have the CEOs immediately or kind of the senior industry level talent that would be able to kind of do everything. But I think if you start building the infrastructure around incubators, where you're starting to take people who are trained here, who've gone to school here, they're starting to learn what it takes to make a translatable idea. Um, start investing at that stage, that'll start kind of seeding the whole thing and it'll start creating that critical mass that'll allow you to kind of continue to build off that. Right. Jim? Well, if we look at the history of Silicon Valley and, and venture capital really was started uh, out of Harvard Business School in the late 50s, uh, so we really can look at the Boston ecosystem in California and there are a lot of similarities. Uh, one, uh, venture capitalists work best when they're working together in very complementary fashion. And so I have a couple good friends at a, a firm called Sequoia Capital. We will compete like crazy for a new deal in the morning, but then we're sitting around the table as board members of the same company in the afternoon trying to get uh, the company to do certain things, either recruit or sign a deal. And so it's a very cooperative, welcoming community uh, when the venture capital personalities are working and when they're working really well with the startups. And that has been the history of venture capital by and large uh, in both the the Bay Area and the Boston area. What I would also simply add on Texas, uh, my goodness, 
there's so many silos. You all see it in universities. I saw it as an overseer of Harvard and on the engineering <clears throat> advisory board at Stanford. It really is uh, quite, quite preposterous to see if it's a new healthcare deal, uh, Brigham and Women's not cooperating with Mass General because they have different endowments and the trustees feel at Brigham they want to own a certain technology, Mass General the same. Then you have the Harvard uh, medical school people in between. Then you have the chemists at the Broad who want to all participate. And so uh, for the great Texas startups to stay in Texas, uh, continue to build world-class institutions, it's not that complicated on one level. It's cooperate, listen, which I love, uh, work with the universities, the administration, tech transfer, the other venture capitalists in the community. Don't be afraid to do small partnerships with small companies. It's really all of those that go into building uh, great companies. And that, I think, is one of the great uh, opportunities here in Texas because there's so much darn intellectual talent. And it, intellectual talent is the scarce resource when it comes to worldwide entrepreneurship. Andrew, can I add, sure. I just have two quick propositions around how we could bring more capital to Texas, too. And so the first, I'll try to be really brief on this because I know we're running out of time, but uh, uh, Texas institutional investors uh, like Utimco and TRS, ERS, put a lot of money into venture capital funds, most of that in California. We have a lot of opportunity that. in Texas. The problem is they write really big checks. So I, you know, let's say they have to write a $100 million check. Well, the fund sizes of a lot of the funds in Texas are $100 million, mine's $20 million. They can't write a check that, that big. And so uh, we, you know, one of the ideas is to create a fund of funds and to let UTIMCO and, and some, UTRS, et cetera, put money into a fund of funds. The fund of funds can write smaller checks into Texas-based investors. Uh, I think that should happen. I just want to throw it you, out you here. Just, you just got drafted on the team that Larry <laughs> Peterson's putting together. Right, right. I think that's really important. And then the second thing, just really briefly, is that uh, by 2030, two-thirds of the U.S. investable assets will be in the hands of women. Uh, they have not traditionally been investing in VC firms and in you know, the LPs that invest in VC firms, uh, yet that's the largest transfer of wealth that, demographically that the world has ever seen. And if we don't get women doing this kind of investing, uh, we'll have a competitive disadvantage problem in this country. So it's like a patriotic mission for women to start investing in venture. Our fund got 80% of our investment from high net worth women and family offices. And so I just want to raise that specter that women are making Great purchasing investments every day for their family, they ought to start making investment decisions that help fund the innovation ecosystem. All right, well, I think that we're getting the hook here, and I apologize, <laughs> yeah. we didn't have okay. time to uh, answer any questions unless you're gonna allow us. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they will all be here, ready and available to answer any questions so, you might have. Thank, thank Andrew, thank you for the, the fantastic Thank you, thank you.